Good evening, everybody. How's it going out in Astro World? We got me, Eric, and Jason here yet again on another lovely Wednesday evening of clear skies on the East Coast. Um, I'm not sure about, well, Jason is now on the East Coast as well, I believe. Uh, I'm actually and, in Tulsa, uh, Eric, Oklahoma. Uh, it, uh, it sucks in Chicagoland. It sucks in Chicagoland. <laughs> it oh, my goodness. Illinois. <laughs> you know, you know, not for nothing. What you have today, I'll probably have in the next day or so. So, so yeah, it's just gonna come. Sitting in right. all east, we're moving in east. Great, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Maybe I'll get some sleep this week. But um, there you go. yeah, so, so um, uh, we had a lot of we got a lot of stuff to go over tonight. Um, we do have a surprise guest tonight. Um, uh, we do have Alan Mitchell. Uh, who's going to be coming on? Hey, Alan. How you doing? He's hanging hey. out in his observatory. And um, next week, uh, we're going to be having um, Scott Roberts from Explore Scientific is going to come on next week uh, at 9 o'clock. So that's going to be good. Um, and then uh, what else? So we got the Mars opposition that just happened. 
Uh, and uh, I made a video on column eight, on a collimator, so we're going to take a look at that, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, RGB and the troubles with broadband and light pollution in the cruddy skies and the Bortle eight nine, or if if you're Jason, you know six five, <laughs> or Alan, I'm, I'm not sure what <laughs> you're, but I think it's better than all of us. What, what I'm, I'm in a nine. You're oh, in wow. a nine, so oh, you're, so you're, no, you're, you're in a nine. So you you're. you're Yeah, I'm a fire. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I don't live in Chicago, man. I live way, way, way. I live about two hours outside of Chicago. I thought you so were like an eight. I, no, 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 no. Oh, I live in, I, 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 I live, I live in, I live in, Alver, I live in like, you know, Aggie suburbia. <laughs> okay, so you now know, you have joined Jason. You now have a you now have a family friend now of people that I hate. So, you are now brothers. <laughs> well, you know it, it's nice to have common company. We still can't hear you, Jack. I can't, I can't hear you, Jason. You're mute. <laughs> Which is oh, weird because I'm, I'm out it's of like talk. You should be hearing. Yeah, me. pretty much. Um, too funny all right we're, we got some bumps in the road here so yeah so so i was in uh camera concepts last week and we were talking about uh collimators and we were gonna yeah. kind of see the difference you know for those people that use newtonians out there for imaging and even you know when you're using those uh laser collimators um the you can get them you know, I guess uh, Orion slash your generic plastic kind of, not plastic, but they're like die cast metal type um, yeah. collimators, you know, with the little kind of white thing on the inside. It's like a blood from Howie Gladder, but not. Um, and, uh, you know, and we want to compare that uh, with an actual Howie Gladder and see brightness and, you know, collimation of the laser and all that kind of stuff and see what the difference might be. Um, I don't know if Jason can possibly cue that up real quick. Uh, might have to give him a couple of minutes, but I made a video. We'll put that on in a little bit. Um, and then uh, I know that, Eric, I know in the meantime, I know that you did a, a lot of work with the uh, the uh, opposition uh, last night while I yeah. was beating myself over the head with my Maxitov. <laughs> uh, so so uh, well, why don't you share what you did and how you did it and all that yeah. good stuff. Okay, so let me bring up my screen here and I will share what we did. So let me bring that up and let it wake up here. Wake up. It, well, you know, I'm also, <laughs> this is all, you know, it takes a while, you know, because of, you know, I was doing the show as well as. Gotcha. Um, gotcha. It takes it takes a little bit for it to get going here. So it's okay. So cool. Now I can do this. There we are. That's better. Okay. So <clears throat> let me share my screen. And if, I, if it lets me, yep. And share. And there it is. So this is actually, I have never really done planetary. Okay. So um, this was, this, so this is basically a first for me. I did two planets um, with my, I use a um, Celestron 8SE, Nexstar 8SE. It was basically my first quote unquote real telescope that my wife yep. got me. Um, and actually got me into Astro getting that SCT. Um, and now look what but I never did. really did. Yeah, now look what I did. I made an orange, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, this is like, it's like the great pumpkin from Charlie Brown. Hey, hey you, you know, know, you know what though? I, I personally, I'd be happy with that because I, I, I'm, I was ready to shoot somebody last night trying to do planetary. I mean, it was just. You know, I am, and on top of that, you know, I was trying to play with a brand new ASI Air Pro uh, okay. that I've never used. 
that I've never used. So, <laughs> so, so you were doing a, so you were doing a lot of first when you were trying to do this. Is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, I'm trying. You know, I'm trying to you know blame it. Like you know, it's always the it's always the ball, not the golfer. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, but then, hey, was... so, so you got yeah. you got this. I mean, you got a lot of landmass. I see. I see the polar ice cap. Um, mm -hmm. You got some decent yeah, stuff yeah, in there. I think. Yeah, yeah. You know, not bad. Now, I uh, you know my question. I know you were using a uh, a um a ZWO um, um, ADC. Yeah. Yeah. I so still can't now, figure it out. Yeah, is that what I'm seeing with the with the orange on the top and the blue on the bottom? Yep. Yep. This is what that's you're seeing. This is what you don't. This is what you don't want to have. This is why you buy gotcha. the ADC, is because you don't want the um, red up at the top here and the blue the down here at the bottom. You yep. know, so I'm still figuring that piece out. Um, hey, dude. I, I mean, you know what? I'd be really happy with that though. That that's you know. For me, I mean, the first shot doing planetary. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for for the first time out, you know, yeah, this wasn't. This is good. You know, this isn't. It's it, it's pretty darn good. I, I would say, you know, for the very first time, really, yeah, using fire capture and auto stackered and registacks and things like that, and I also used um, pit, um, which okay. is in another um, stacker. Um, I believe it's kind of a stacker um, where, it, where it reprocesses your AVI file. So it reprocesses either use SER or AVI and it reprocesses them. It'll even do um, a batch or a join mode. Right now I was doing Jupiter and messing around with Jupiter. And you can actually, if you had multiple, so if you have multiple files like this, you can actually go into join mode and join them. Um, oh, nice. So, which is, which is, which is, which is pretty cool. Um, so you can do that and it was pretty basic. Um, so I converted all my SE, all these SER files into AVI. Um, and I just dropped them in there. You have to choose planetary. Um, and then I went to my output options. I chose my output and I did, um, AVI and the AVI is, um, raw uncompressed. And you can actually put in, um, if you're using WinJupos, you can actually check the box and it'll, and it'll generate a WinJupos um, file name with all of the date time stuff. Um, so when you're putting this into WinJupos for derotation, which I haven't done yet, you can, um, you can Oh. What was Whoa. that? <laughs> what was that? What was that? With the flip. <laughs> that was that was loud. <laughs> I don't know what that was. That was our guest know, moving his microphone. But, um, so yeah, then you then you go to your do processing and you can click start processing and it'll process all of those files either individually or as a batch and or as, in, as an individual batch or they'll merge or if you choose that join mode it'll join all of them together yep um that's pretty cool. so yeah so that's, 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 that's this is free yeah it's a free program yep. and that's really cool about all of the stuff that you use for planetary pretty pretty for the most part it's all free yeah if, what yeah, fire cap of if you you know you know fire capture is free pip, pip is free when post is free um auto stack auto stacker and ready stacks they're all free yep so and they're really really great pieces of software you know so once this was done and then um if i go back here and i go to mars Then uh, after it was all converted, then you go into um, Auto Stacker, and then you open and you can add those particular file, you know, one at a time, and you, then you can go choose Planet, and then you do a quality estimator. Usually, I just keep this at all at the default, and you do an and you do an analyze, and what you want to do is you want to try to get it up 
as much above this 50%. You really can't see it here, but there's a bar yeah. right here in the yeah. middle. And you want it's to get right your where, quality. Right where that, right, I'm sorry, right where that blue second blue line is, you can see it. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So if you see these guys here, you have the itty bitty blue line right there, right in between. So you got this, 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 and this. So it's almost like um, 25%, 50%, 75. So yep. you want to try to be right above there. So this is one. I mean, I'm I was I'm doing Jupiter, and doing that. I'm um, over a lot of points there, man. <laughs> yeah, and so you Woo. do that. Then you do analyze. And then you um, choose the percentage that you of the frames you want to have stacked. And I started out with um, 20 and 30% of the best frames and did an RGB align and then I do a drizzle. And I actually chose to do a, not a manual draw, but an automatic drawing of the alignment yep. points. And yep. I said, um, do you can do 24, 48, you know, alignment points. I went down to about 32 because you can manipulate this. You can go up and down, you know, yep. um, and then I said, place it on the grid. And then once it's all placed on the grid, then I stack. And once yeah, you auto, stack, auto stack is really cool. Yeah. Auto stack is really cool. Then when you stack, you end up getting the auto stacker files that you have right here. Like I did for Mars, I did like 10, 15, so on. But you get the same, yeah, you got like whatever you put like here, that. you'll get that in your file. And then once you do this, then I haven't gone into it yet, but then I think that's when maybe it's either that right after this or just after you do an initial um, cleanup of the noise in Registax. Like right here is Jupiter, and as you can see, it looks like crap. <laughs> um, because I, I, think I, see the red, I think I see the red spot. You see, you can see, kind of see the red spot there, that kind of yeah. faint looking thing right there. Yeah. But, you know, the, one of the biggest struggles that I'm having, and I will give planetary guys huge props for this because they must know something, you know, and the tricks on getting their focus. I mean, pinpoint, man. I mean, that's one of the things, especially when, you, when we've talked about in the past about collimation. Yep. If your collimation isn't practically perfect, perfect your yep. focus is going to be junk, especially when it comes yep. to planetary, um, because you've got so much atmosphere to deal with. Now, another thing that I was reading is that a lot of these guys, they use uh, mono cameras. And with mono cameras, you don't have as much of the, you don't have the okay. ADC stuff that, that the, uh, the atmospheric distortion as much to deal with as with um, a color camera. Um, but, you know, I have a color camera, so I have to deal with it. <laughs> but it. I it. it's, but you, I can, but you know, I can see the bands, I can see the red spot faintly and stuff like that. So it's something there. I'm really thinking it's my collimation that is really throwing things off. And I just really got to figure out, um, now I've got a, a, a feather touch focuser, the micro touch feather touch focuser. Yep. And, uh, you know, it's, it does fine because it did pretty decent with Mars. But I don't know. I'm probably going to have to get some sort of. Um, I'm probably going to have to get an EAF or you know something to. Um, well, how, how many images this, do you have in this in this file here? How many images did you use? Um, on this one, this was just one file, just one oh. AVI. Oh. So and that's another thing I need to learn is that how do you do? I need to start getting you know like for example, I've got all no. of these files right. So uh, are they all thing where I put them all, do I have to put them all together? You have the, you have the ABI? You have the ABI? Um, you have the ABI? Uh, yeah. So yeah, let me go back here. And here, here's all the pips. And hey, so how long is that ABI? Yeah, so here's 
Oh, those are tiffs. Sorry. No, but yeah, I, a lot of these yeah. are like AVIs. Like here's an AVI. Yeah, right there at the bottom. Right there at the bottom. Yep. No. So here's an AVI. Yeah, and this is like a huge one. But see, look at this. I don't know if you guys can catch that. Yeah, but you know what? You know, you know that I don't. I think there your focus is way off. But I mean, that's what I'm saying. Um, did did you dump that AVI into Auto Stacker? Um, not this one. No, you could dump um, you could dump AVIs into Auto Stacker and then let it chop it up. Oh, see that's see this is what I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, I'm you using just, you one just take AVI. AVI you dump it in there. Okay. You want to know so, a trick for getting Jupiter into focus? Don't do it. Ears, man. <laughs> don't, don't even focus on one of its moons first. Okay. Oh, there you go. Focus on you need a point investors. source. Use one of the moons and get the moon in uh -huh. focus. And then center Jupiter back on your sensor and um, rip, you know, 300 or so frames off of that. And then do a quick stack uh, to test how those 300 frames worked with that focus point and see how mm. it works. That's what I used to do with my 1100 is um, Jupiter was never easy to focus, even with an eyepiece. So I would just use the, uh, the moons. And if I could get the moons pinpoint i knew jupiter was as focused as it was going to get okay yeah that's a good point okay now that's one of the things because i was using a batten off mask in here i'll stop sharing for now so um and we can get back here did you, so did you focus the planet with a batten off yeah don't throw the batten off okay. away if you're doing planets okay unless you want to focus See? on stars right next to the planet that's another method mm -hmm. you could use. If the planet's moving through a part of the Milky Way galaxy and there's a bunch yeah. of field stars in the area, use the stars adjacent to the planet. Slew off the planet mm -hmm. so it's not um, contaminating your frame with light. Yeah. Focus on the stars. Uh, you can use a Batnov that way. If you're not going to use a Batnov and you want to use the planet, focus on the moons and then get the moons oh. as pinpoint as you can. Then that's when you center your planet and do your imaging that way. Um, okay. And I'm sure that, you know, Chris Go, Damian Peach, David Carlish, um, they've all got their own little techniques for doing it. But if you put a Batnov mask on a on a planet, it's not going to work well because a Batnov uses point sources and the planet's an extended source. You're not going to know that you're perfectly centered or not. And we all know critical yeah, focus is such a tiny window. Yeah, yeah, yeah it definitely is. See, you got the pooch there. <laughs> oh, yeah. My little Maverick wanted to come up and hang out with me. There you go. Nice. There you go. Uh, yeah. So those are the things, you know, so I'm learning and I will give big props to the planetary guys because it, it is, it, it's nothing. At least for me coming from dealing with DSO for as long as I have to go into planetary, <clears throat> it is a switch. It is quite a, it's a learning curve. Um, but it's really cool. I mean, if you can get it all right, it's it's awesome. So I'm gonna have to um, try that again. Um, get you know the like you're saying, get the moon into focus, get that pinpoint, and then go for it. <laughs> um, yeah. I, let me shut off my. There we go. I forgot I have a screen sharing one. So yeah, um, but it's it's been fun. Um, I still have to, to learn. There's so many tools in, in fire capture. There's a, there's an ADC tool that supposed to help with, um, with, if you have an ADC, um, there is a, I had no idea. You can auto guide. Let me fix this here. I think my camera's down a little. It's insane. It's insane. You know, I took the camera down a little bit. <laughs> so let's see. See if that's any better. There you go. But there we go. So there's a um, there's auto there's an auto alignment. There is um, there's auto guiding, which I had no idea about, but I was messing around and I happened to come across um, uh, star stuff and. Um, What's it? I can't remember his name. I'm drawing a blank. Um, Dylan. 
Yeah, Dylan. Yeah, Dylan. He was doing, he was showing about, he's showing, you know, he just recently did it, did, did a video on um, fire capture and some of the things that he does when he's doing planetary. And also, you know, this the guy who, who developed fire capture he did it all and it's all free and you know he takes donations so i'm actually you know contributing you know 69 cents you know a bit you know towards <laughs> his development of this of this software because it's fantastic software and it, he does it you know he's giving it out to the masses for free so and if uh, you're a planetary guy yeah no it's not robin it's another gentleman because yeah, Robin did um, Sharp Cat. Robin did Doctor Robin Glover. He did Sharp Cat. Is another. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Who does uh, fi- who 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 created Fire Capture, and did it all for free, um, all open. So you know, I felt, hey, if I'm using your stuff and it's really benefiting and it's helping me out as much as it has been, um, I'm gonna you know I'm gonna say thank you and you know contribute you know so you can help develop. Same thing what I do with Astro Ben. You know, I became a um, a patron of Astro Ben and, and yeah, as well too. as Telescopius. As well as Telescopius because for the you know, they do awesome work, you know, for a little, you know, for a little money, at least from what I can tell, you know, and um, hey, if I can help out to keep them those guys going, I'm all for it. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, planetary and this whole opposition it's been really interesting um i think was it yesterday was the actual closest or was it the last week i can't recall if it was last week or no, it was it's yesterday. Right. last week was yeah. closest approach yeah yep. closest approach yeah so last week was closest approach so um but i was but still it's still relatively close <laughs> so you can still get yep. out there and um, I've, i even had um family members, you know, calling me, you know, who have no idea about, you know, astronomy or anything like that. They're like, hey, E, what's that big orange star out there? I'm like, because <laughs> I'm a star, I love you, but that's a planet, <laughs> and that's Mars. <laughs> but they don't that know, so I'm happy, but I'm happy to share information with them and, you know, help, you know, and say, yeah, I was out there, you know, in the middle of the night doing my thing. So it was a blast. It was a blast. So um, I've got to just I've got to keep working at it. So, well, yeah. I'm definitely glad that you had a lot more luck than what I did. Um, I was, I was, of course, you know, I, you know, opposition and, you know, all these like wonderful things that happen only once every once in a while. And of course, mm-hmm. I try and play around with some new equipment on, on important days, like a, like a moron. And, um, I couldn't even get it in focus. I couldn't get it. I, I couldn't do anything right. So I was just like, you know, I, I realized that, you know, I, I, what you said before was true. I mean, it's a completely different monster when you do, uh, planetary as opposed to uh, deep sky objects. And, um, it's, it's a completely different technique altogether. And, yeah. uh, it's, it's it's just like you know I, i'm i'm more than happy to uh go to the thousands and thousands of uh deep sky objects out there and uh stay far 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 away from planetary for the time being <laughs> <laughs> so. yeah but it's something where you know i'm going to you know i'm gonna i'm gonna keep at it you know i'll bounce around between my sct and you know and my my rasa and my refractors and um, every once in a while, I'm going to, you know, put the 8SC back on the, um, the 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 60 here. And I tell you, the CEM 60 was rock solid. I mean, I love this map. You know, it, it it kept everything in, you know, perfect. So yeah, planetary is so fun, but it is. What, 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 what do you got going over there? Yeah, yeah. I'm, what do I got I'm, going on? You know, yeah, I'm just yapping. <laughs> Doesn't black. really show up that well. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it's a black <laughs> telescope with a red light in the middle of the night. That's nice. the uh, <laughs> that's the uh, RC8. Oh, okay. the Richie. Okay. Yeah, I got my Richie Crichton. I got it all dialed in. Um, everything's working. I finally got auto guiding figured out 
um, that that took a while. I bought a QHY camera, and uh, the drivers, something about the drivers, the um, PhD would crash. Sorry, I've got this webcam here. That's let's try that. There. So the drivers would cause PHD2 to crash continuously. Um, I'd be able to keep it up for about five or so minutes. Sorry if that's okay. loud. I, they live directly under where the Southwest Airlines fly into Dallas. So nice. Um, <laughs> yeah. So hey. I sent the QHY camera back to OPT and nice. uh, bought a ZWO camera. Um, I'm not even sure which one it is. I think it's the 120 little lipstick guide camera guide, guide, and guide. phd hasn't crashed since i've switched over to that so that's working out just great for me and uh, so i've been doing 10 minute subs on the elephant trunk tonight i'm doing oxygen and let me see you know, yeah, it's on the bottom. yeah it's on the bottom of the little red tv there we go so Share. Sorry about the Hall of Mirrors effect. Yeah, all good. <laughs> so that 200%. Whoops, that's too much zoom. Yep. <laughs> so you can almost start to yep, make out a it. silhouette. Yep. Right yeah. Right here. Yep. And this is with oxygen. So this is the O3 okay, channel. Yep. Um, dust donuts show up really well. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, but um, let's see if there's a way. Open an image. Let's see. Now, Alan, what's your image? What's your um, imaging camera? Is it a 1600 or is it something? Yeah, it's the 1600. Okay. okay. Let's see. Hmm. Trying to find out where my images are. Let's see. Here we go. Uh, someone else that uses quick and dirty too. <laughs> I think I got that from you. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> he does have that effect on people. So this was a single 10-minute sub from last night in oh, hydrogen. Wow. Okay. Nice. That, that is awesome. awesome. I like the the frame awesome. Yeah, I'm very happy with how this is coming out. Yeah. The RC is going to be really, awesome. really soft. So I got to get some oxygen in there. I got sulfur last night. I haven't looked at any of the sulfur subs. Should probably open one of them up and take a look. I was real busy at work. Didn't get a chance to go through any of my data from last night. Mm -hmm. What camera are you using? It's just a random sulfur sub. And there's some structure going okay. on. Yeah, you can yep. see the structure. Yeah, you can. So that's the uh, ASI 1600 mono. This, yeah, no, this is really, really cool. I just love what I'm excited the RC. about. I'm just excited with how round the stars are after 10 minutes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because I'm imaging at 0.7 arc seconds per pixel. So I had somebody ask, "You've got a Paramount. Why are you Why are you auto guiding?" Is it because it's 0.7 arc seconds per pixel by periodic error? is bigger than that a lot bigger than that um i think i'm still like four arc seconds peak to peak Go ahead okay and stop the screen there so i'm still like four arc seconds peak to peak and uh with a 0.7 arc second pixel scale mm -hmm. it's like five to six pixels of motion every four minute or yeah four minutes i think is the warm period on a paramount so okay. Yeah, I need to guide. I need to guide out that residual yeah. periodic error. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So how um, long have you had the RC? How long have you had your Richie Gretchen? I received it in 
mid-April, I think. Um, okay. Okay. And <clears throat> I wasn't able to start really using it until June because there were... We were discussing this on, on uh, one of the groups um, on Facebook earlier today. It's like, why is everything sold out? And that was my problem is, you know, just because you buy an OTA does not mean you're ready to start using it, right? Um, exactly. The GSO focuser, um, I wanted to do a motorized focus with it. What's up, little buddy? Okay. He keeps nudging my hand. He wants me to pet him. Um, <laughs> so I needed, to, I needed a motorized focus for the uh, Richie Crichton. And a buddy of mine was going to make one for me. Uh, he's got a 3D printer and all that stuff. And so that oh, took yeah. a couple of iterations. Um, I needed the uh, focal reducer from astrophysics for it. That took a little while to get in. Um, yeah. And then what else? Oh, eventually I ended up having to go with the moonlight focuser instead of the stock GSO focuser. And then there was this whole okay. saga about that. Daniel, I think I ranted at you about that one day um, <laughs> yep. where the threads were wrong. Yep. <laughs> so it was uh, it was this whole ordeal of um, just tackling one little nuanced problem after another. And then Neowise happened in July. So I abandoned this and just went out with a little um, iOptron Skyguider Pro and a DSLR for a couple of weeks. Yeah. Okay. Hey. So August and September were kind of iffy months in terms of weather, but I was able to get everything working. And now here we are October and it's humming right along. So awesome. Nice. awesome. Well, good luck now, with it, man. So yeah, as far as collimation is concerned with that, mm -hmm. um, what do you use to collimate that? Uh, I've got a Cheshire eyepiece uh, and a Howie Gladder uh laser with the holographic concentric rings and gotcha. um i've actually learned that and there will be a video coming out on this um i don't want to mess with the collimation while i've got it on a target um i'm going to be doing elephant trunk for another couple of nights but once i'm done right. with elephant trunk i'm going to do the videos uh for youtube on how to do collimation for a richie Crichton. um i have learned that almost every video about how to collimate a Richie Crichton telescope is wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and I'm going <laughs> to, yeah, okay. I'm going to expose that, is that those more, lies. Okay. <laughs> Thank God I didn't make more. one. <laughs> yeah. Is that, now, is that more for the tube type? You know, are they wrong on the tube type or are they wrong, you know, for the truss type? Or do you think they're just wrong? Is it, or, or do you see something an issue with both types as far as how collimation so is done with them. That's a fair question. And really it's um, if you have the, the type where your focus tube and mirror are mated. So I okay. don't know of any, I don't know of any 10 inch truss or tube that are that way. But if you have an eight or a six, they will be. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really not truss versus tube. It's more of, How's that rear cell assembly uh, constructed? Flat. Gotcha. gotcha. <laughs> he wants love. That's all. You know, they want He does. Love, he, <laughs> my, dogs me alone. No, my dogs are with the wife. They're just sitting there chilling. Yeah. I work from home just like most of us during the um, yeah. pandemic right now. And he's in yeah. my lap from the moment I sit down with my coffee and log into my work laptop, he gets up in my lap. I'm doing conference calls. He's in my lap. Fortunately, we don't have to do video. They stopped requiring that. So <laughs> I, I hear you because trust me, every once you'll, you'll see mine, you'll see Titan over here trying to get attention because he wants it. Yep. They, 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 they love you and they want, they want, they want, they want that love. <laughs> yeah, my, and what's I hang out with the wife. This is Maverick. Yeah, maverick. that's a great name. That's well, he looks awesome different, name. so he's a maverick. <laughs> I just always hang out with the wife because she gives him treats all the time, and I give him nothing. Yeah. So. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I, I made like a, a seven minute video on collimation um, that we could kind of throw up there. Um, yeah. Just kind of destroy the the myths of uh, not of collimation of a uh, of a Richie. But um, of these little 
tiny one and a quarter inch um, collimators that are out there that are, you know, the, the, you know, the black ones with the solid tube and, you know, mm -hmm. it, you know, it's got a little, like the so, so, uh, Celestron makes one, Orion makes one, a couple of the, a lot of vendors make this type and you'll see it in the video. Um, mm -hmm. but, um, it's what you'll see in the video is definitely shocking. I mean, it, it's kind of, kind of, I can't believe they actually sell these things. <laughs> But um, um, I guess let's throw it up and see what people have to say, and then uh, we'll take it from there. Yeah, roll that beautiful bean footage. <laughs> Hi everyone, Dan Higgins here over at World, and uh, I was over at the store the other day with Jeff from Camera Concepts, and uh, we were doing a little comparison between the standard collimator, which you get for about 50 to 70 maybe $80, uh, versus the uh, Howie Gladder style collimator, and wanted to see, number one, we wanted to see if what uh, was said was true, is that the laser collimator in the Howie Gladder is always uh, dead on straight. And even if it isn't, and you'll see in the video, that we have set screws here that we could actually collimate the laser inside the collimator. Uh, so I think that the results were quite shocking. I hope you feel the same. And here is the short video on the collimator comparison. Hey guys, what's up? Dan here with Jeff from Camera Concepts and Telescope Solutions. And I know all you guys have seen this type of collimator before somewhere. And even I've used them at times, you know, when I first started out. But Jeff is showing me something right now that I thought was quite illuminating and uh, actually shocking to me. So, so Jeff, what do we got here? So, I use this little device in order to test collimators. So, collimators like Howie Gladders, Astro Systems, there are a lot of good laser collimators on the market right now. But there's also a lot of junk, okay? And here's how we test it. And this is one collimator made as Dan says, under very many different brands, okay, all with the same horrible results. I want you to take a look at this white area here. If you can see it, you'll see a rather light laser point. That's what this laser is putting out right now. It's not excessively bright, but it's enough. It's enough to do the job. So if you use this laser and you set it on and you set it on to go onto your dot, you think you're in collimation and watch. All I do now is rotate this collimator. And theoretically, since this is a round cylinder, that dot, that shouldn't, dot move. shouldn't move. Yeah, it shouldn't all. move at all. Right. Watch. Look at that. Nice circle. Nice Look at that. big circle. So now that doesn't mean that the barrel is curved. That just means that the pointing whatever pointing screw that's in there, the laser is incorrect. Is at an angle. It's at an angle. Like a poor marksman, you keep missing the target. These are cylinders here, these wheels. Everything is round. Yeah. Everything is in contact with each other. Look at that dot move. And that dot is going to make that big circle. And when you think you're putting it right in the center and getting your mirrors collimated, you're nowhere close. But here's the real kicker. If you take a careful look at the collimator body, there is no way to adjust this collimator for this kind of error. Yes. You don't see any set screws here, and that is a disaster. So it's going to remain here to be seen as an example of what not to buy. And these things go for almost 70 bucks. Wow. So it really pays to uh, be careful about which collimator you're getting. All right. Well, I won't buy those anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so now we got, instead of this whatever, <laughs> we got the two inch and one and a quarter combo from Howie Gladder. And look at number one, the brightness of the laser is, is just, yeah, you, know, you can't really, you can you see it a little bit more here, but it, you know, it's a lot brighter in person. But as we spin it, Ready? Yep. Look at that. Doesn't even move. Not a bit. Doesn't Absolutely even move. Absolutely solid. And Get out of the way, Maria. <laughs> <laughs> and 
if it ever did go off. Look at all the set screws we got. So you could adjust, adjust it. Everything can be adjusted. Anything you wanted, just like the way we're doing. So if it's yeah. a little bit out of whack, you just take a set screw, take an Allen key. and. But Howie used to, when he was alive, would tell every customer, you drop this off of a 12-foot ladder, I guarantee it will still remain in collimation. And you want to know something? It's true. You can absolutely beat on, 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 on grass, right? You can beat the hell out of this. <laughs> And it still stays in collimation. But if it ever goes out, yep. you can make the adjustments. It's quality. It's not cheap. It's worth every penny. Absolutely. I, now, that's what I've gone to now. I, I Unfortunately, when I bought mine, they didn't have the combo like this. I just have the two-inch barrel. But, I mean, it's it's great. Uh, it's okay. It was a garbage one anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Beautiful piece of equipment. Yep. All right. So, Howie Gladder. Collimator, get one, and get results like that. Okay, so I hope you found that as illuminating as I did. I thought it was very, very shocking that we saw that the first collimator made a nice big circle when you, uh, when you put it on the rotating uh, rings, and then when you put the Howie Gladder collimator on there, it was dead on. So it's wonderful. Even if the Howie Gladder isn't dead on, it's nice to have these... Uh, little set screws here that you could actually uh, change the, uh, the the collimation of the laser. So so definitely recommended. I definitely approve of the Howie Gladder. I've had one for many, many years. And it's super important that when you take your collimator and put it inside your focus tube that the laser is going to the same point on your mirror at all times. Not if you turn it and it goes somewhere else. It really makes no sense because now you're collimating two different ways. You may never even get focused. So, that being said, uh, Howie Gladder has definitely um, stood up to the reputation. So thank you so much for watching. And if you, uh, if you like what you saw and you want to see more of the reviews and some comparison videos that we have out, uh, feel free to subscribe and, and like us and hit the bell and make sure you get the notifications on when we put on other content. So thank you so much for Masterworld. And remember, keep imaging, keep educating, and keep having fun. And we'll see you next time. Clear skies. Wow. Great job, man. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, sure. I you just thought it was so though. weird. Yeah. I mean, I thought it was so weird when he wrote, when we rolled that the first time before we were making the video and we saw mm -hmm. that arc on the laser. I was like, there's no way in hell you're going to be able to collimate anything with this. Is every time you put it in, it's in a different spot on your mirror. Now, the Howie gladders, are those primarily in these collimators? Now, these are primarily for reflector types like Newtonians and Dubsonians. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, wow. you, you want to do something? Like... Go ahead, Alan. I was going to say, if you've got a uh, refractor and it's a well-made refractor, you'll never need to collimate it because the elements are Correct. spherical. So it doesn't matter how yep. you turn it. It's a sphere. It's like a basketball surface. If you turn a basketball, <laughs> it doesn't matter how much you rotate that basketball. It's the same curvature facing outwards. So... Right, right. Um, if it's well made, well figured, you know, things like William Optics and uh, Stellar View, obviously astrophysics, you know, uh, Takahashi's, those you're, you're not going to have collimation issues um, with the, uh, the elements if you can get them put into the cell and locked in just fine. I've actually taken my Stellar View apart and put it back together and I got no collimation issues. And I just literally just stacked the glass back in and, and did it all. Um, you are it, a well, better man than I. That is not for faint of heart, man. I'll tell you that. I, I, yeah, I, if anything, I would have just sent it back to Stellar View and just say, fix it. <laughs> yeah, I screwed up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry, man. yeah, there was, <laughs> there were some, there were some problems with, um, I had metal shavings between the flint and the crown Ooh. inside of my um, I, I, objective. Wow. I have no idea how the metal shavings got in there, but I needed to get them out. So, sure. Yeah. yeah. Holy cow. Wow. Wow. Oh, oh. But, um, well, that, that, yeah, but, so, no, but, but Dan, that's a great video, man. That was really, really, you know, informative, especially, you know, 
for us that are getting started and we're thinking about, okay, we're buying a Newtonian or a Dubsonian, especially if you're doing visual any, or just yeah. period, visual or photography, what have you. Um, and you're spending this kind of money on a telescope, um, you should be able to get products that should stand up and be as just as good of quality, you know, or ex that you're paying for, you know, it is that yeah, I'm saying you get what you pay for, but, but still, I mean, 70 bucks is 70 bucks, man. And it's still, yeah. that's, that's not, that's not cheap. No, it's you know, not, so, and, you know, it's that combo type of laser that they, you put it in through something slanted like that. And it's going to be, unless you, unless you have one and you can find one that there, there are those out there in that black barrel that do have some mm -hmm. set screws in them, but it's mm -hmm. very tough to find. Uh, usually yeah. in order to get set screws, you need, a, you need an Astro systems or a Howie Gladder, mm -hmm. uh, or something that's, you know, 200 plus to have those yeah. able to, to have the ability to uh, change the angle of the laser. Right. That's, but no, that's really good. That's a good video. So, yeah, you know, one of the so things there, when it comes to collimation, yeah, when it comes to collimation, um, I'm, I'm actually, um, we, we discussed this last week, um, Jason brought it to our attention, the Tribatinoff mask. Yeah. So I decided um, Farpoint Astro is, they sell um, Tribatinoff mask for SCTs, Mead, Celestrons, um, so I decided to buy one and it's going to be on its way. For, um, I hopefully be here within the next week or so. It was only $29. So it's supposed to be fairly good, at least be a good aid for your collimation for your, for SCTs. So yeah, I'm going to give this a shot and if it works great, but I've, I've got waiting in the wings. I'm ready to press the button on that Hotec advanced CT. <laughs> I yep. am this close in getting that guy, you know, and I've seen Dang. that there are some available. I've already told my wife, I says, look, if this $30 fix doesn't do it, we're spending the money. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you so, know, you, again, yeah, you yeah. Just want to throw this out to the, to a, a couple, actually I got a phone call from a, from a customer regarding the whole tech and I use it probably at least once or twice a week because it's it's great for you know your medium size schmitz or rcs but um mm -hmm. if you sit there and you try and use it on anything smaller than seven and a quarter inches not gonna happen not gonna happen yeah. you won't have enough space in the to turn the lasers so even though know, when you turn it you go to their website and it says available to collimate any schmidt or RC or whatever. That's not true. Mm -hmm. Read the fine print. It's seven and a quarter. And I believe it's got to be less than a, uh, I don't know a lot of people that have this, a less than a six and a half inch uh, central obstruction. So, um, okay. you know, things that are very, very important that you got to keep in mind. So an eight inch mid will be fine. A 10 inch mid will be fine. Um, you can use it on, on a six inch. You can't use it on a six RC. Uh, you can't use it on anything smaller than that. Or it won't return the beams. Yeah, because I think when I was reading, um, it's good, the, the, the one that, you know, I was looking at purchasing, it's good for up to, I believe, 14 inches, but then you yes. have, they have other ones that are slightly larger. And there yep. are ones that are specific for, um, they have add-on features. So if you're using a, um, say, a Hyperstar, or if you sure. have a Hyperstar or a Rasa, there are other types, there are other brand uh, models mm -hmm. that you can't yeah, there's a special order, I believe. Yeah, they're special orders. So if you have yeah. those types of Schmidt Castle grains um, that you know using Hyperstar with it, you can you know purchase those. So for me, I'm using this one, and uh, eventually, if I can get this collimated, and if I can get um, planetary well enough to justify. Then maybe next year, instead of looking at the RC, I might look at an 11 inch, you know, a C11, a C11, the, um, the XOT, not the edge, but mm -hmm. maybe because, but the XOT and um, take a look at that. So we'll see, but I've got to get the collimation down. I've got it before I do anything within, if I 
with another investment, you know, I'm going to get this eight inch down first. Uh, did, did, did I mention that uh, I, I, I pulled the trigger on a new toy? No, you did not. What did you get? Uh, what is Santa uh, bringing you? <laughs> well, I, unfortunately, because of, I guess, COVID, it's not going to be Santa. It's going to be more like the Easter Bunny, even though I'm ordering it now. <laughs> oh, jeez. Uh, I, I ordered a big brother to the 80 Esprit. Um, I, I got the 120. You got the 120. All right. <laughs> yeah. I got, I got the 120. Um, you know, I, 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 you know, I what was that? I said you're gonna you're gonna enjoy that 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 larger you know that that seven inch. Is it, is it a seven or a six inch? Uh, one twenty. Yeah, one twenty six. Yeah, one twenty six. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, uh, it's you know I had a one twenty seven from Explore for about a year, uh, mm -hmm. with the, but it was an FCD one, so I dumped that for the eighty Esprit uh, okay. because of a better glass. And now I'm back up to the one twenty again, so. Okay. I mean, uh, hey, you know what? I, I'm looking forward to it. Hopefully, hopefully it's not. They said March, so I'm hoping okay. that's not true. <laughs> but um, okay. But um, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm psyched. Now I just got to buy Good. a focus for it. <laughs> so. Do you know of Do you know of anyone that's ever attempted or been, or ever tried to use, say, a two X PowerMate with a refractor? No. They're primarily for Schmidt. For, for, for use four. I've got a four inch power. Or, I'm sorry, not a four inch. A four X power mate. Um, I've use? used it on my stellar view with it's 102 millimeter or no, no, it's the 105, not the 102. Um, okay, I've done that. Okay, I'm just I'm curious. Tried. I'm just kind of curious on um, looking at. I'm trying. You know. This stuff is highly expensive, so if I can try to justify, you know, to the boss to get a power mate, you know, instead of getting, say, like a Richie or this or that, and I can get some, you know, a better focal length, you know, if I can get 2,000, you know, or 1,800 focal length, you know, on well, certain what things. Are you, <laughs> what are you hoping to achieve with the power mate, aside from elongating that focal length? Because we know power mate's going to give you a double the magnification if you go with the 2x so what is it you're right. ultimately trying to achieve well for me it's about trying to get deeper into the nebulosity into nebulae um it's great to see the overall structure you know the overall structure but i would like to have the opportunity to actually have a a, um, a, a larger a slightly larger longer focal length so i can get into those clouds Okay. So and you're going to need to really take your images for four times longer. Yeah. So, yeah, for every minute that you normally expose without it, you're going to have to do four minutes just to get the same flux on the sensor, um, which means that's a lot longer for things to go wrong. So you're definitely going to be guiding, and um, I hope you're good yeah. at auto-guiding. Uh, the other thing that you're going to want to consider is, are your optics even capable of resolving those little structures, those tiny little knots and curls in the glass that you're looking thing. to resolve? Because right. if your optics, um, let's say, I'm, I'm just going to throw this number out there. Let's say your optics only do two arc seconds worth of resolution, right? And then you throw mm -hmm. a 2x power mate on there and you try imaging at half an arc second per pixel you're going to have a lot of, um, you're never going to feel like you're in focus because those two arc second details are going to be spread across, you know, eight or so yeah. pixels. It's, they're always going to okay. seem soft. Um, okay. So, yeah, you can do it. Yes, you'll get good images um, if you can get the guiding and everything to work out. Drizzling and dithering um, between images might help you recover some of that lost detail because of the, um, is it over or under sampling that you'd be doing, but um, it'll help it you recover some of that, but not all of it. Right. Um, but sometimes, I mean, the answer to the question, uh, um, there's there's always the the cheap way to do it, which is the Barlow mm -hmm. or the Power Mate. Yeah. And Power then there's the right answer to the question, and that is throw more aperture at it. Right. Yeah. Right. That's true. And you have a great point there. So it's those struggles, you know, that sometimes you have to think about, you have to think about budget and, you know, want to make the wife happy, <laughs> you know, everybody happy. But um, 
you know, because I'm, like I said, I'm still in the fence looking at the RCs. I, I just mentioned I was looking at the 11. So I'm all over the place right now. And I'm not really sure what I want to get just yet. I know that, but I do know is that I want to get, you know, I, I would like to have the opportunity to really go in there because there are certain, like, for example, M16, really getting into the pillars, you know, checking it out and, you know, getting that, getting that data out a little bit more, you know, and, and, and looking at that a little bit more. That would be an awesome image. Um, if you're looking at, say, the, um, the cone, you know, nebula, looking something more into that, even, you know, the elephant or, um, you know, things like that. So getting really in there and looking at those, you know, those hydrogen clouds, looking at that structure, you know, though that was, those are the things that ultimately interest me. I mean, the overall, you know, the outer structure, that's really cool, but to get in there. And to really look at that, that's that's something, you know, maybe more of a scientific thing that it kind of interests me. Hmm. So, you know, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. But Alan, you do make a really good point because one thing you do, I do want to, I don't really want to have those soft images. You know, I want to have things that are tight and crisp and I'm not great at, you know, my, my auto guiding is fine, but it's not, you know, top, my, my skills with auto guiding are super top notch. So, you know, we'll yeah, see how as, as you know. start adding more uh, focal length to it, it becomes super more critical uh, to, yeah. you know, get, you know, get your auto guiding down. Cause once you're over 2000 uh, millimeters yeah. of focal length, man. And I've got, you know, I'm using the OAG and stuff, you know, using the, the off axis guider or, but, you know, sometimes would that even help using the OAG if you're going that deep into nebulosity, would you be able to, you know, be able to find a decent star, you know, to, to lock onto, to guide, would you have to still end up using, you know, a, a slightly longer focal length guide scope? You know, like say a, a 71 or 81 mil, 71, 70 or 80 millimeter guide scope or something like that. Or you just, you know, stick with the OAG. Who knows? Oh, man, we got, yeah, we that's got why we of... big Go aperture ahead, and then I reduced it down to the focal length I want rather than taking a small aperture and blowing the focal length out to get the magnification I want. There you go. And what's the um, focal length of your RCA? With the reducer, it's 1,113 millimeters um, okay. as determined by astrometry.net when I plate solved an image. Okay. So um, native focal length, I think, is, well, it's an F8. It's 203 millimeters, so a roughly 1,600 millimeter. Okay. Okay. And even at F8, you're, you, you can even, you know, you can image pretty decently at an F8. You know, it takes mm -hmm. a little longer, but you can still get some nice imaging out of, out of an F8. We got, we got a bunch of comments that I've been kind of not watching. I've been interested in the conversation here. So um, let's see. Uh, Sean Nielsen is on. Uh, see, he says, hey, guys, how's it going? Good to be here setting up a planetary system. So this is a good, good topic. Um, uh, uh, Rini Hounsel, uh, anything about collimation I cherish. It's my biggest challenge. Uh, Mark Ellis is looking to get something else new. He's thinking about getting a 10 RC. Yeah, we've uh, even talked about that for a little bit. <laughs> you know, he's been bouncing back and forth for a while. Just like me. I think he's still, he's still getting over the, the chroma drama. But um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, Eddie uh, said, I have a Howie Gladder. I love it. Um, Rainey said, so much for the eBay laser. Um, <laughs> I like the far point collimator in Cheshire. Um, Alan has its Alan texted in there. Um, yep. George says, hey, Alan. Uh, so, hey, uh, Dan, George hey, yeah, yeah, George Lutz, yeah. Yeah, yeah George Lutz, yeah. He's on quite a bit. Yeah, he's on, on with us quite a bit. Um, 
Mark Ellis told me I need to buy a Nightcrawler for the 120. Uh, Dan, you should have bought the Toa 130. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, sure. <laughs> eyepiece projection method for deeper imaging. <clears throat> and that's the last one. So... Uh, eyepiece projection is interesting. It's just uh, I've never actually gotten it to work very well. Hey, what is that? Uh, so basically, um, you know, like the old, uh, well, not the older, but the uh, the camera uh, adapters that you put on the front of a DSLR. or and it's got a place where you can actually put an eyepiece in there with a set screw that you could image through the eyepiece. So you get not the magnification of you know, you talk about the T adapter that you would put onto like um, a Canon or something. Or, like or you got your T mount, and then, you know, you got your T mount, and then you got the camera adapter that you would screw on. Sure. Okay, so that camera adapter, they make an eyepiece projection camera adapter. It's a variable camera adapter that you can actually okay. slide an eyepiece in there. Um, oh. And uh, it, it's it's really difficult because if you don't have because it's done with a uh, it's done with a set screw. Okay. And the, I don't know any of them that make them with a, like a compression ring, but um, it, it's for me, uh, maybe I'm just a little bit of an idiot, but um, for me, it was hard to get that eyepiece angled at the right angle to your chip to kind of make it worth any <laughs> effort to that. Um, so, you know, it was, it was very hit and miss for me. So I tried it a couple of times and then I just took it and I, I think it's in a box somewhere. What are you doing, Maverick? Okay. <laughs> but, um, hey, you know, Alan, that, that, you, you know, know. Sorry, when you Go collimated ahead. your RC, how long did it, how long did it take you when you first did your first collimation of your RC? And how often do you my collimate? Very, my very first collimation? No, of your current of your RC. Yeah, my very first collimation of my RC. Remember. Yeah. I... Do you want the very first collimation where I had all the proper tools to do it? Or the very first time I figured, <laughs> I'll collimate this. I know what I'm doing let's when just, I didn't. Let's start, with the, let's start with the first. Let's start with the second one. Yeah. Let's just go with, yeah, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Let's just go for it. And then we'll figure out. Then you can twitter down to, now I got the idea. <laughs> okay. So the first time I screwed my collimation up, it took me uh, two hours to do it. Nice. Okay. Um, yeah, that was the, the, it took me two hours to screw my collimation up the first time. Um, and then that was because I did not have the collimation ring that goes um, between the rear cell and the focuser. And that's, that's a handy piece of kit to have. If you're going to buy an eight or a six RC, they should include that. Like it should not be an optional accessory. It should, they should just put it in the box and charge you the $50 extra for it right off the bat you you need it there is there is no way around it um not that i found um so you once i finally got that and that was another one of those parts i had to wait several weeks on to get um because they were back ordered they had to come from china um and of course that stuff comes by boat and it was probably a three or four week journey from china to get here oh, um but once i got it the i had the howie gladder i had that piece um, I did not have the Cheshire, but I borrowed one from my buddy, Tim, and um, I was able to collimate my telescope in 35 minutes. And then one day I was really bored. I had nothing to do um, at work that particular day. I collimated my telescope eight different times, eight different ways. I randomly adjusted all the screws and knobs everywhere. And uh, I collimated my telescope eight different times in just a few hours. So now I believe I could collimate any Ritchie Crichton um, that's an eight inch or a six inch. I have not done the the 10 inch, but I'm pretty sure I could probably do those too. Um, but I could do an eight or a six, any, anybody's um, who has bad collimation. If they were to bring me their telescope, I could collimate it. I think I've practiced enough. Um, I'm not going to make any claims as to how quickly I could collimate it because the worse it is, obviously the longer it takes to do. Mm -hmm. um, right. But I, I, I think I understand the process well enough now that I could collimate any out of collimation, Richie Crichton. Um, the, 
the stigma or the myth that Richie Crichtons are notoriously difficult to collimate. Um, I think part of that is the information on how to collimate those telescopes, the particularly the eights and the sixes is incorrect. Um, mm -hmm. And really they're not, it's just, it's just an iterative process. You do the same three steps over and over and over again until you're satisfied with the results. You can't get it perfect. Um, right. You will drive yourself insane chasing perfection, but you can get it so close. It doesn't matter. My Richie Crichton's not perfect, but I mean, you saw the data tonight. You saw the image from last night. Nobody would mm -hmm. ever guess that the collimation was off, but it's not perfect. Right. It doesn't have to be perfect. Chasing right. perfection on a Richie Crichton is going to make you go crazy because the tiniest, tiniest change will set it off, but you're not going to notice it. A big change you'll notice. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. So, hey, Mark, if you think, think about that RC, <laughs> give you just, a call. You just, asked, <laughs> you just asked what exactly is a, a Cheshire collimating eyepiece? So basically, um, what I know about it, it's like a long tube with a little hole in it with a crosshair. For the most part. I mean, if you want to add a lot to that, you know a lot more about it than I do, Alan. So. Well, that's those, those would be what I would call the fancy Cheshire's. Um, the one that I have from Farpoint, it doesn't even have the crosshair. It's just a two-inch slug of metal, kind of like your Howie Gladder that you slide right into the focuser draw tube and it's got a hole right in the center. And you just, yep. I mean, if you're like me, you got to take your glasses. See that? I think I just lost him temporarily. Really? Yeah, I think so. I, I think he's showing his screen. Or is that you? That's not me. No, I think that's that's not me. Maybe that's Jason. Maybe <laughs> somebody's <laughs> showing a fuck. Somebody yeah. showing a, a Cheshire. Yeah. yeah. So that that center there, um, that 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 silver part on the top of that Cheshire, that's the part that goes inside of the um, the focuser, and there's a little hole that you just get right up to and you peer inside of it and you center the, the mirror, that silver ring that's on that Cheshire and the outside of the OTA and you just make concentric rings by looking, I mean, you see the reflections of the mirror um, and you get that concentric ring pattern. Um, and so you just center that stuff the best you can with the Cheshire and that gets you probably 95% collimated just with this piece alone. Um, then, okay. then it's time to switch over to the Howie Gladder and dial it in. And then it's a matter of just rinse, lather, repeat. You do your Howie Gladder, you dial it in, you pop this thing back in just to verify that you're concentric all the way through. And then if you're not, you pull it out or you make whatever adjustments you need to, if you need to, you pull it out, you put the laser back in, you do the whole laser routine. When you're done with the yeah. laser, you pull the laser out, you put the Cheshire back in, you look in it, you look for the concentricities. And once you're happy with it, once you're satisfied, you're done. Okay. Yep. It takes All maybe right. three or four iterations um, until you get really practiced. I can do it in three. I'm sure that there's people out there like Doug Bach, who um, he's been imaging with an RC for several years. Um, I bet he could do it in one. Wow. Wow. Yeah, and, yeah, and you know, the only thing I, you know, collimation, you know, I do Schmitz and I do Newts, and that's it. I don't know anything about RCs. I have not touched one yet. Um, but uh, you know, I mean, star test for Schmitz, and and you know, and that that's it. and then uh, Howie Gladder for the Newts, you know. Yeah. So what yeah. if overall with the with your Richie? Um, what has been your feeling compared to your other scopes imaging with your other scopes and now having your Richie and imaging with your Richie, what are your feelings towards, you know, how much your how much, as far as on a scale of one to 10, what would you give the Richie compared to, you know, in working with the Richie 
in imaging with it, especially with your imaging compared to say your other like your refractors and stuff like that? So in terms of ease of use, the the refractors hands down the simplest telescope to image with. I mean, you just slap a camera on the back of it, you put it into focus and then you're done. And it always works. You don't have to mess with anything. Um, refractors um, have generous fields of view. They've got sh uh, the shorter focal length, so they're a little bit more forgiving. So mm -hmm. let's put, let's just say refractors are a 10 out of 10, okay? Okay. Um, Sure. In terms of ease of in terms of ease of use, I'm not even going to go into the image quality and stuff like that. We'll just say in terms of ease of use, the 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 refractors they're 10 of 10. Okay. Yeah. Um, I tried doing deep sky astrophotography with an 1100 edge HD at f10, and when I was really naive at f20, um, and and that was that was a three of 10 in terms of ease of use. That was not easy to do at all. Uh, the mm -hmm. Richie Crichton. It's complex to set up because you need the, the collimation ring. You need to replace the focuser. The stock GSO focuser is not up to the task for doing imaging with an automatic focuser. And I need an automatic focuser to find focus. I've got an astigmatism. I need to wear glasses. And even then, I don't trust the focus when I'm using a computer screen with these glasses if I'm sitting there um, manually dialing in the focus. So I need an sure. autofocuser. Right. Um, and the GSO focuser itself is not up to the task for doing autofocusing, especially when you throw on um, an off axis guider, uh, which adds to the complexity. Um, so I would say that a Richie Crichton on a scale of one to 10 is a five in terms of ease of use. Okay. Wow. okay. Um, that's my experience. People who are doing maybe different types of imaging, maybe they're going after comets, brighter targets, where they don't need an off-axis guider. Um, they don't need the, the focal reducer. Um, they can get it dialed in manually. They don't need the autofocus or stuff. Um, they might find it to be an 8 out of 10, right? I have a complex setup. The complexity makes it a little bit more difficult to use, but it's not impossible. It's a 5 out of 10. Now, in sure. terms of image quality goes... Um, I say that it rivals refractors. I mean, you saw the results with hydrogen alpha elephant trunk. Yeah. I've, I've imaged it last year with my stellar view, which is, in my opinion, stellar views are every bit as good as astrophysics at like one third the price. And the image was amazing. It was one of my favorite images I've ever made. The image I'm producing now I'm more excited about, and it's not even done. I'm more excited about the single individual sub exposures coming off of this camera than I was about the final image last year. So in terms of image quality, I'm going to say it's probably a nine out of 10 or a 10 out of 10. Um, it, it's on par with refractors. The only thing is, is it's ha again, how well do you want to chase perfection with the collimation? Once you get it collimated well enough where it's, you know, close enough that it doesn't matter if you get it any better, it, mm -hmm. it's every bit as good as a refractor. But you don't have to worry about chromatic aberrations because it's yeah. um, an apochromatic. Um, the field is really reasonably flat. I'm using a astrophysics focal reducer. It's their um, 67.67x reducer. And okay. the field's relatively flat. I've got minor vignetting, and then the OAG clips one of the corners of my imaging, um, of my sensor. Um, and there's nothing I can really do about that. It, it doesn't present a problem unless it's almost perpendicular to a corner, like at a 45-degree angle from, from right. level. That's the only time it ever intrudes on the sensor. Um, but if I move it any further away from the sensor, I lose the stars. So that's kind of where gotcha. it's got to live. Gotcha. But wow. um, yeah, it's reasonably flat. Um, it's more flat than my stellar view, but I don't think it's as flat as like an edge. I mean, when I had my 1100 edge, that was flat. That was crazy flat. Um, <laughs> it's not quite there, but it's flat enough. I mean, I, I, I take yeah. flat frames and that, that gets rid of the vignetting. And yeah. I really don't notice any uh, distortion in the corners. Um, I mean, I have a little bit of flexure going on, and I've got a uh, tilt adapter that I don't have the back focus um, anymore for uh, to fit it in there. 
Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I've got a tilt adapter. I could probably take that out. I would have to take the off axis guider and the focal reducer out to do that though. Right. Now, another question I have is when it comes to do, um, when you're starting, you know, the changes in the weather, you have do and things like that. Um, what do you do as far as a dew heater for a Richie Creighton? Is there a dew strap or something like that? Or you need to, do you have to worry about it or what have you, have you had a chance you have to, to worry experience about it. it? Sure. Yeah, you have to worry about it. Um, so like a Schmidt Cassegrain, it's got that corrector plate on the front and you would put a dew yeah. strap around there to keep dew from forming on it. Or you could yeah. use a dew shield and, 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 and let that worry, um, let that handle the dew. So when I got the Richie Crichton, I got to thinking, well, it doesn't have the corrector plate, but the OTA is my dew shield and the mirrors in the back. It's it still fogs no. over on, on humid nights. Um, so there has to be um, uh, a dew strap that's going to fit this because I've, I've seen them out there for eight and nine and, um, you know, larger Schmidt Cassegrains. So I'm just thinking I would just buy that size dew strap. I've already got a dew management system for the Stellar View. I would just need the longer strap to plug into it. But I'm not yeah. doing any dew management right now. I need it. Um, we're in the time of uh, year down here where uh, we do get a lot of condensation every, every night and in the morning. And um, I have looked into my mirror and I've seen it fogged over in the mornings. But my images are doing okay. It's not impacting the imaging yet. Um, so okay. it's happening, but it's not bad. But there will be a time where I'm going to lose stars and probably lose the mm -hmm. guide star because of um, condensation on the mirrors. Okay. So you would think maybe just a standard, um, maybe an eight inch, like Schmidt, you know, for like an SCT, that type of a dew scrap, you just hook it up to your dew heater, you think you'll be fine with something like that? Or you have to go with something? I with think so. I think so. I don't know if not having a corrector plate is going to make the difference because the corrector plate is going to help retain a little bit of that heat so it doesn't immediately escape out of the tube. Mm -hmm. So when you put that dew strap behind the primary mirror, but you don't have a corrector plate, that heat can still escape right out. I don't know if that's going to yeah. make a difference for the dew. Um, okay. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, yeah, thank you. There's some... Um, there's times where even with a hair dryer and a dew strap, you can't keep the dew off of your equipment. And, and, and that's, that's not just Texas, that's everywhere. So those are the yeah, nights yeah. where it may not matter. And my luck, when I go to test out that dew strap, it'll be one of those nights and I'm going to think it's not working when it's actually just a night that nothing would work. Gotcha. <laughs> It's getting breezy uh, down here. I don't know if you're hearing the wind hit the microphone Mark or not, but I'm is, hearing stuff all around the observatory. Mark, Mark is asking, what focuser did you put on your RC? So I have a uh, moonlight focuser. And uh, what I did is I actually called them up because I had originally purchased the, uh, the wrong one. And the order had already gone through and they had charged my credit card and everything like that. So I wanted to call them up and ask, hey, um, I ordered the wrong one and I'm not sure now that I'm looking at the right one, um, what it is exactly I need. So I thought I would just bounce some ideas off of you. And so when I talked to them at, um, moonlight, they walked me through the process and, um, you, for what I'm doing with my moonlight, you actually can get away with basically the most basic focus or you don't need the dual speed. You don't need, the excessive travel, um, like I think they come in three different travel sizes, one inch, one and a half, and two. Um, I don't okay. think you need the two inch, one and a half is enough. Um, but yeah, if, you've, if you're going to go with a moonlight, just call them, tell them what you're doing and what telescope you have. They already know what focuser you need. They've made a focuser for a customer who has basically every telescope imaginable already. So they already know what you need. They've already done it. Yeah, Ron, nice. Ron is, uh, as far as his customer service is concerned, Ron at Moonlight has, does an outstanding job. And the, all the staff over there is so knowledgeable over there on, on what you need. I've, I've ordered three telescope, three um, focusers from them over the years. And uh, yeah. I know that uh, 
Yeah, I know that what's his name, uh, uh, Mark just got his Nightcrawler and he loves that. So, I mean, you know, it, they make quality, quality stuff. And it's probably a good couple hundred dollars less than a feather touch and just as good. So, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, uh, I'll, I'll never use anything but a Moonlight at this point. Because, heck, you know, one of the things like with me doing planetary with this SCT is I'm going to use this 8SC until, you know, I get this going right until i get this whole planetary bit going and i'm using basically i have a feather touch that i purchased um but i had it along you know i got that when i got the asc but i'm questioning do i move you know since i do want to try planetary and it's and i'm strictly going to use this asc strictly for either doing some visual or for planetary until i get you know things straight would it make sense for me to go look at, you know, contacting Moonlight, have a chat with them and say, hey, I've got a, you know, an 8SC here. What can you do for me? Because I want to do planetary. Um, is it worth it? <laughs> or do I just I'm think you know, it's, it's, it's worth it? it. <laughs> it's worth it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so here's the beauty of it. You buy that uh, Moonlight for an 8SC, mm -hmm. I believe if you get any other telescope that's a uh, Cassegrain style, like a Richie Crichton or a Mac, mm -hmm. you just buy a $90 flange or an $80, however yep. much they are, that fits that rear mm -hmm. cell. And then the moonlight you already have just buckles right onto that new yep. flange and boom. So you Way don't you need, you don't need a moonlight for every focuser or for every telescope you have. You just need a moonlight for every telescope you're using at the moment. Gotcha. Yeah, and then nice. the, and the flanges would cost you anywhere from sixty dollars to about a hundred max, and uh, you know it, it, that's an easy, easy, easy solution. And especially you know if you're sitting there, and if you already have a, a moonlight controller, mm -hmm. just flop it on there, and you're done. You're done. Now, do you have a moonlight? Uh, oh, flipping the flip. <laughs> Doing the flip. Doing a flip. Oh man, when's my flip? I'm I'm like imaging. When, when I don't even know what my flip is. I've been imaging the whole time since we started the show. Uh, let's awesome. See. Look at it go. My, uh, my flip's not for another hour so, and a half. Are, uh, what are you using to do your imaging? Are you doing it off a laptop <laughs> or uh, Eagle or something like that? I love it when it does that. That's great. Right. <laughs> That's awesome. I'm even happier when it finds a guide star and just continues on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. As, um, when everything, don't you just love it when a plan comes together? <laughs> <laughs> what are you using to image? Are you using a eagle or a laptop, or what do you got going on? Who is that question for? Uh, for you. Uh, oh, um, sorry, Alex. Uh, so I'm using a uh, a laptop, which is the laptop I'm I'm using for the conference. It's running Sequence Generator Pro in the background, and um, right now it's doing the Plate Solve too. Um, and then it's just a little USB cable that goes right into the base of the Paramount. It has its own USB hub, and um, uh, the mount control system is in there. And then the USB hub in the base of the mount has through the mount cabling that comes out of the back of the um, saddle plate. I got two USB 2.0 ports there. I run one of the USB cables into my um, focuser, and the other one goes okay. into the back of my 1600. And the 1600, as we know, has its own little USB hub. Right. And that USB hub runs the uh, filter wheel and the guide camera. Nice. nice. So, yeah, I've got kind of got Indeed. a daisy chain of hubs going on. Right. <laughs> whatever works, man. <laughs> whatever it, works. Man. Exactly. Whatever works. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I've seen I've seen systems out there that you know you look at it and you're like oh my god what a mess but you know what it works <laughs> so yeah so so as far as you know I know I know like I guess uh, I guess you and I uh, Alan are now probably the worst as far as uh, light pollution is concerned uh, regarding imaging because of uh, <laughs> Eric just uh, Eric just got the portal scale about two points somehow. <laughs> But, um, but um, uh, you know, 
what do you do as far as, you know, doing broadband imaging uh, from where you're at? As far as uh, combating the white blue. You avoid it, yeah. I, 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 I do that. At- <laughs> You know, I, I, I know I, just like you, have probably been relegated to strictly narrow band at this point. Uh, but, um, yeah. you know, if you were, if you wanted to do a globular cluster or a, a galaxy that's, uh, you know, a broadband target, what would you do as far as uh, trying to combat that Bortle 8 9 sky? So. Yeah, uh, got a little bit of bag of tricks here for that one as well. The first thing I would do is um, I've got a IDAS um, uh-huh. LPS D2 filter. And uh, so I would throw that on. And I just bought a new one. It's another IDAS filter. I can't remember which one it is. I've used it before. That one is very, very strong. Um, I I was imaging... This is on the stellar view. I put it on this spring. I think I might have been doing Andromeda. Um, okay. And it was it was almost impossible to make out any detail on that galaxy uh, with that light pollution filter. It is just way too severe. Um, so, okay. um, yeah, I I'm not going to use that one probably for much, but. Um, the other IDAS uh, light pollution filter I have, um, that one works relatively well. And I, I, with the stellar view, I was able to do four minute exposures without too much light pollution getting in using um, red, green, and blue filters from ZWO. Um, as I understand it, there are red, green, and blue filters that you can get from various different vendors. I'm not sure if um, Astronomic is one of them or Chroma. Um, that are, they're not like the whole red spectrum. They're like a narrower segment of the red spectrum. Um, so they kind of have a little bit of light pollution suppression in them. Um, I'd have to research. I I saw somebody post the, the light curve or the, what are the, the band pass charts for these filters and they showed where the red, the green and the blue are. And there was actually Mm -hmm. some separation between the colors. There wasn't any overlap. Um, okay. I might want to try and find out who those are, but they um, supposedly it's a red, green, and blue filter that uh, can eliminate some light pollution as well. Okay. All right. But yeah, it's basically a light pollution filter and then um, exposure control. Um, how long can I go before the picture gets blown out? Um, and then I cut that back by half. So if I can do an eight minute photo right before it blows out, I do a four minute exposure. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, that's a good. That's a good idea. That's a good. Idea. It's probably the wrong methodology, but that's what I do. Hey, what a, you know? I like I said before, whatever works. <laughs> you know, that's it. Because uh, you know, I mean, you and I are in the same situation with this, and, and you know, like all I've been doing for the past year now is narrow band. You know, I mean, just been plugging away at it, plugging mm-hmm. away at it, and uh, you know, I, I want to do a galaxy here, I want to do a galaxy there. You know, because it's just something that I want to do. And I, you know, like I'm, I'm doing Andromeda right now and it's like, it's, it's a mess. I'm doing like 25 second exposures because, uh, you know, the core is just getting blown out, <laughs> yeah, you know, but, um, I mean, who knows, you know, I'll do it. I'll slap an HDR on it, see what happens. And, uh, you know, we'll see, but, uh, I'm not expecting much tonight. <laughs> <laughs> So after, um, Alan, so after you are done with um, the elephant trunk, um, do you usually set up a plan as far as um, what you're going to be going after um, um, at you know, a certain period of time, you know, during a particular month? Um, do you do any type of planning like that um, and say, yeah, during this time of the month, um, these are going to be like these nebula are going to be more out there, you know. So I'm going to make a plan to do this. Yeah, I actually have a, a Google Calendar with um, every target that I could image throughout the year. Um, and each target gets a two week window. And some weeks I've got like five or six targets lined up. Other weeks I don't have much going on. 
Um, but those were based on um, those targets were selected based on my backyard, um, not sure. just what's in the sky at that time of year. It's you know I've got a ridge line for my observatory right here that I can't see past. So I've got a, a roof horizon here. Um, I've got okay. the absolute ugliest light dome that starts about here, then goes all the way over to here. And that's, you know, Dallas and then the suburbs on the north. But yeah. over here and straight east, it's dark. There's, you know, I'm, in, I'm on that corner of the Metroplex, so there's not a whole lot of light pollution over there. So the targets that rise over there right after sunset to zenith during a two-week window, those that's how I planned my targets um, for me. Okay. Um, and so actually tonight I'm supposed to be doing M74, but... I don't want to lose the elephant trunk um, to the light pollution uh, this year. So I bumped M74 and I'm doing the elephant trunk, which was actually on the schedule of targets to do in August. But in August, I was not quite automated. It, this this wasn't quite working the way that I wanted it to work yet. So. Gotcha. Okay, cool. I mean, the, I know that uh, Eric and I had a stretch back in uh, back in September where what would we have like five or six straight nights? Yeah, of, yeah, uh, at least uh, beautiful. Yeah, beautiful skies. I mean, it just stretched all the way from from like the center of the country all the way to, to Long Island, and it was just yeah. clear skies for like a week. And uh, that is something that at least on long island i'm sure chicago you know or the suburbs of chicago is the same way um yeah. that it's unheard of it, it's rare you know it, it's really really rare to get a stretch of almost a week long of nothing but yeah. clear skies you know and, and I, it, 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 it I literally left my, yeah i left my telescope on the pier for the entire week not scared of anything yeah. <laughs> so so uh <laughs> You know, so I'm sitting there. So I got, I think I got 20 plus hours of each. The wizard, the bubble, the elephant trunk, North American, and the pelican. <laughs> okay. Over the course of that week, you know, and, and it was just, I, I let it run all night. I let it run all night. Yeah. That's and, it. Uh, I, I was, it was, it was, I, I, you know, having that pier in the backyard, even though it's not in a, an observatory like Alan has. Um, mm -hmm. on top, I mean, you know, polar alignment, it's just not even polar alignment. It's more of a polar adjustment. Um, it takes about, <laughs> yeah. it takes about less than like 15, 20 seconds to get it done. And, uh, and, and you're off to the races. I mean, it, yeah. it, it's a wonderful, wonderful, it's definitely the, the, the second thing that has transformed my imaging, um, to, to be a more enjoyable slash easier because i am inherently lazy uh so 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 mm -hmm. um it, it's it's really really a great thing if you if you just put a concrete thing and a pier up there i would say do it <laughs> yeah yeah i got my pier i'm just gonna i'm i i'm just waiting um now that it's getting the, the weather's changing i'm going to uh, actually plan on installing it next spring after the thaw, I'll go ahead and I will start digging, <laughs> start digging the, the right. that thirty inch that thirty inch wide hole. <laughs> and uh, hopefully, by the you time know, you start digging, uh, you know, I'll have my new scope, and then and then by the time you're done, you'll be clouded out because I'll have the new scope. So <laughs> oh, great, yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> what a guy! <laughs> uh, yeah, I got to share the love, brother. <laughs> yeah, no, right. After I, after I dropped the bomb on you that I've got Bordo five six guys, you're like, yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna screw you over. <laughs> man, I'm horrible. gonna screw you over. <laughs> oh man, ridiculous. Yeah, but uh, what time? Let's see, it's it's ten forty three. All right. But um, so but yeah, you know, I, I think that uh, broadband from a Bortle nine or a Bortle eight is very, very, very challenging. Um, I think that you know most. Work for it, man. I mean, it, it's hard. I mean, it's hard. I mean, that's why I've been staying away from it. But I just wanted to see. I never really did broadband from my backyard. If I did broadband, I would travel to a dark sky on Long Island. 
And, mm -hmm. you know, now that it's permanently set up out there, you know, I'm not going to be moving around as much. So, you know, I said, you know, let me just try something and uh, don't laugh at me. But when I put it up, uh, you know, you could laugh later. But, <laughs> you know, you know, you wasted seven hours on what? <laughs> you know, but, um, what are you going to do? Yeah, that's it. That's it. So, you know, um, doing broadband, yeah, in a heavily light polluted area, I mean, it's almost, you know, you had to ask yourself, why, why would I bother? Because you look at, you know, like, say, for example, Chuck Ayub, he's right in the flight path of the Detroit International Airport. Yep. He doesn't do, he doesn't even bother, you know, with broadband. He does all narrow band, you know. Yeah. Alan, I'm sure you pretty much the majority you do is mostly all narrow band, if I'm if I'm assuming correctly. You know, so yeah, no, it's no. almost like yeah, it's it's almost like when you're in that level of light pollution, it's like why even try? I mean, unless you have an opportunity to go to a dark site, you know, it's one of those things that I would question personally. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so about a month ago, I went to the ranch where they do the, uh, the El Dorado star party, which is going on this week. Um, me and some friends, we went there a month before the ESP kicked off and they're like portal two, And it's, it's great. And I was like, well, I'm going to do some narrow band here because I'm just so dead set in doing narrow band, but I miss <laughs> going to dark skies so much so that um just a couple of days ago hold on somebody won somebody came back um <laughs> i miss going out to dark sky so much with my telescope to do the broadband stuff because i bought the richie Crichton to do galaxies and you sure. just you don't do galaxies with narrow band so right. um what <laughs> if i don't really believe you <laughs> so anyway i just bought a car two uh i just bought a car two days ago so i could uh pack my stuff up um this spring and uh, go because i i sold my car back in march you know um we just didn't need two cars when everybody's staying home right and uh so my wife and i we've just shared one car for the last uh seven months and yeah without having a car payment for seven months and you know eating at home a little bit more and even though i spent money on this i still was able to mm -hmm. save up enough money to you know get a a pretty decent used car um yeah. that'll be able to you know it's a it's, uh it's a crossover so it's got the okay. cargo space i actually took everything to the dealership that i would <laughs> take to a star party and put it in the back of several different suvs to see which one would fit best and uh <laughs> hey you got to do that. <laughs> the car salesman was just absolutely flabbergasted. He's like, I, I've been selling cars for a long time. No one has ever bothered bringing boxes to see what they can fit in the back <laughs> of a car. I did a similar thing uh, when I bought my, uh, bought my RAV4. I have, a, I have an 18-inch obsession that I bring to star parties where, you know, it's it's a big monster. I mean, that's not obviously not an imaging thing, but that that's strictly visual. But this thing is on wheelbarrow handles, and you got to push this thing up the back mm -hmm. of the thing. And the wheelbarrow handles go a good. It's sixty one and a half inches from the tip of the wheel to the end of the handle. So if I want to put the whole thing in, I was like, listen, I don't care what you got to do, but with the chairs down, it needs to be at least sixty two inches. And, and she was searching <laughs> all over the. She's like, man, that's so long. What are you doing? What are you doing? I said, it's got to fit my telescope, man. And I, I got to be honest with you. With COVID and everything, I haven't. All the star parties have been rained out. Cherry Springs have been rained out. I went to um, Virginia for um, for another star party. I went to Deer Lick. That was that was a mess. And three years I haven't taken this telescope out now. So I've had my car. Now it's time for a new car, and I've never even put it in it. <laughs> but um so what do you use um do you take you um what do you use for your travel mount are you are you taking the paramount or are you taking do you have something else that you use for your travel mount um if you're going to go to your um go to a dark side party oh you it's do this. take that okay oh, yeah 
Um, I'm 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 not uh, I'm not one of those uh, who owns multiple mounts. Um, I I have different telescopes, but I won't own multiple mounts. Um, I just just one's enough. So sure. you know, I don't have a seat gem or an AVX. That's my little grab and go. Um, mm-hmm. I'll just take the mount. Um, okay. I don't. I don't have anything against owning more than one mount, um, other than it's where would I keep it, right? If right, I'm not yeah. using it, I got to store it somewhere. And the observatory right. has kind of been the, you know, the agreement was, you know, when I get the observatory, if it's astronomy related, it gets stored in the observatory permanently instead of in one of the closets of the house. And yeah. uh, so I don't have a whole lot of space in here. You know, now that I've got everything all set up, you know, space is limited. And so, yeah, yeah I don't yeah. see myself getting a second mount um, to store in here, you know, for three nights. You know, I might use it three nights a month, you know, when I go out to a dark mm-hmm. site. No, I'll just take the Paramount. Sure. If I'm going to go yeah. travel somewhere dark, I'm going to make it count. So I'm not going to take the sure. grab and go. I'm going to take the one that performs a little better. Absolutely. Sure. No, makes That's sense. Good. Absolutely makes sense. Now, is that, honestly, do you have that on... Um... Do you, so you, do you have a travel, like a tri-peer or a travel peer? Cause I, or is that on a peer? Because I'm thinking that on a peer right now. So do you have a different, like a tri-peer or something like that? No, it's on a tripod. Oh, it's on a tripod? Oh, I thought it was on a peer. Oh, okay. I thought that was on a, I thought it was on a peer. <laughs> okay. Yeah. There you go. All right. Nice day corrected. <laughs> so that makes it real easy. <laughs> It's a Burlaback Planet tripod. Mm-hmm. So it's all wood. It's ash. It's hard. It's heavy. I mean, the tripod weighs probably fifteen pounds. Um, okay. And uh, it the thing it it does do a really good job dampening vibrations, but it's not perfect. Um, but it does a very good job. And then when I go to star parties, I'll take uh, three bricks with me. And I'll put the bricks down under the, the feet because the feet are pointed because it's a surveyor's tripod. Yep. And so it'll sink into yeah. the ground when I get everything there. But I put these bricks yeah, on yeah. the ground and then I put the tripod feet on the bricks and let it settle during the day. And then that night I'll get it polar aligned and I don't have any alignment issues the rest of the night. Okay. Nice. Ah. All right. Well, coming up to 11 o'clock, fellas. Yeah. Yep, we're almost at time. I'm, I'm yep. falling asleep, I think. <laughs> been a rough, been a rough week at work. That's why I've been kind of quiet tonight. I've just been it's just been working like a dog. It's just been a mess. But, yeah, I hear um, you. I hear you. Same here. I mean, what you know? For me, we're getting because I work. Um, I work um, for a few minute food manufacturer. Um, we're getting in that time of the year you know, baking season and stuff like that. And so it starts getting, you know, a little crazier <laughs> when you're, you're trying yep. to do all this stuff. So, yeah. I hear you. So I, hear you. I, 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 to, I, to, I totally get that now, now that the, the holidays are approaching, you know, so we get a little bit crazier now. And now, of yep. course, when also when, um, when summer is over, everybody's pretty much done with all the holiday stuff. It's not holiday, but their vacation stuff is and then, so all the production starts ramping up again. <laughs> so it gets a little bit busier. So oh, no, yeah, I hear you. Um, sci-fi tangent, really quick. Um, did I mention to you that uh, Ernest Klein is coming out with Ready Player Two? You did. Yeah. So <laughs> yep, we're looking forward to it. Um, it's in November when it's supposed to come out and Steven Spielberg has already, you know, pretty much said if, um, if they decide to make, you know, go forward with a sequel, you know, he'd be more than happy to work with Ernest Klein on a screenplay. <laughs> so, well, you know, I, cool. I, I, I had yet to see the movie. Um, mm-hmm. I read the book. Um, yeah. I read the book and the book was, was completely awesome. I mean, I thought that was, yeah. I know I'm a big Rush fan, so that made it even a better book. Um, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm just wondering if they get to pull another Rush song out of there to kind of make you know, you know, <laughs> make, make two. 
But um, you know, I, I I thought it was I thought it was great how they incorporated all the different '80s type and '70s even uh, type yeah. mantras. It, it, it's really, really, it really great. I thought it was great. I thought it was great. Um, yeah, and but, uh, I I was I have heard that they, they that uh, Ernest Klein at a convention spoke of the synopsis of the book, okay. and it's basically. Um, Halliday has, after, you know, um, Parzival and the, and the crew, they, they found, you know, the, the egg and everything like that. Right. But it turns out there's one more, there's another egg, one more ah. out there ah. <laughs> that, uh, that did, that's been out there. And now there is, and there's another antagonist that will do almost anything to get to this. And basically, you know, totally control the oasis. So, um, all right, it's one more, one more run, one more, one more adventure. Uh, looking for Holiday's last egg, you know, and we'll see what happens. So, it comes out next month, and looking, f- and I've been looking forward to it. So, I, I can't wait personally. Well, I'm, and, I'm uh, about four, forty-two minutes left of. Peace talks. The uh, all right. The, um, the uh, in Dresden file. The Dresden file. Yep. Yep. And, and what uh, are your thoughts so far? You know, are you almost forty-two uh, minutes done? So. Oh, uh, so so I, I I like the I like the new bad guy. I think that that was a really good twist that nobody really saw coming, and I think that yep. you know that the whole supernatural world coming together kind of thing is. It's kind of, you know, in all fairness, kind of something that what we need right now as, as, as humans right now, uh, yeah. kind of are coming together. Um, yeah. And uh, you know, I, I think that, and I know, Alan, I don't know if you're, you're into this stuff or not, um, but this is a, it's a bunch of books that we both read. It's called The Dresden Files. And um, it's like a 20th century wizard type thing. It's a little, little science fiction fantasy type thing. Yeah. But um, no, I would I would be down to read it. I just yeah. I don't oh, do a whole lot of reading anymore. But well, I, I used to. I mean, I've, I think the last book I read was um, A Song of Ice and Fire. And, okay. Uh, okay. Um, okay. That was That's great, uh, great book. It was. It was great. awesome. And yeah, then great, I, great, I got great, on to yeah. about halfway through Night of the Kings, and I ended up putting the book mm-hmm. down for some stupid reason and never picked it back up, and it's been like three years. Oh, wow. Yeah, well, I, I read I read them all, and The Song of Ice and Fire, and I want to say it, it followed the same thing as the TV show as far as I'm concerned. Up to the fourth book was great, and then after that, I just wanted to, I just couldn't wait for it to be over. <laughs> I just couldn't wait for it. To, okay. It was just too much. It was just too much, yeah. too many characters, too much stuff going on. It was, it was, it was a lot. I mean, anything that needs like a map of like the main characters. I mean, it's, it was a lot. It was yeah. a lot. Yeah. I even, I even lost who is, who is, who's cousin and who's uncle. And it was, it was crazy. <laughs> But um, yeah, when, but, uh, when, yeah. When the book comes with its own family tree appendix per family. <laughs> yeah, it's, per family. It's <laughs> yeah. Oh man, yeah. it was out of control, man. I was like, and you know what? And, and if you you read the books and then you watch the TV show, you get really screwed up in the head because what they did in the TV show is that with some characters, they kind of merged <laughs> two or three characters to fit their storyline. Mm-hmm one character and i'm like he didn't do that he didn't what are you talking about where's the <laughs> other guy you know you know but um you yeah. know it, it, it you know i think i think that i thought so like same thing like with lost lost did the same thing to me too four seasons awesome after that it was crap you know i was <laughs> going with lost after season three three yeah. well whenever the i whenever the whole island arc was done then i was done yeah. When they were pressing the button up the whole time. They were nine. pressing the button. What was that? <laughs> he wants in my lap. And then I put him in uh, my lap. And then he wants to get down and sniff around. And so I set him down. And he sniffs around uh, the deck. And then comes back over to me. And he puts his little paws on my knees. And he looks up at me with the big puppy dog eyes. Like, I want to be back in your lap. 
Uh, too funny. That's cute. I think he's getting tired of what it is. I think he wants me. I think he's trying to get my attention. Like, let's go inside and go to bed. Yeah, I'm finished. Yeah. I want to go to bed. Yeah. That's it. Well, this was a great show. Alan, thank yeah. you so yeah. much yeah, yeah. for, yeah. for hopping on, on and joining us. Yep. <laughs> this, was, this, was, oh, yeah. <laughs> this has been a lot All this right. was a lot of fun and really informative too so dan great job with that with the collimation video as well yeah yeah i'll post that up on, as... on on the channel yeah and then we'll uh what's up yep oh yeah all right well all right guys so so don't forget um next week uh, we are going to be having um, Scott Roberts from Explore Scientific on, and he's going to be our special guest uh, next week. Uh, we also got in uh, in future shows, we also have uh, in November, I believe, we're going to be having Sean ne Nielsen from Visible Dark. And in December, I'm hoping if, if she's ever off, uh, and I hope she's watching, um, if she's ever off holiday, um, uh, Stacey Downton from Astrostace. Uh, in December. Uh, so uh, th those are some things we got going on the works. The uh, Just so everybody knows that the, the website uh, is almost finished. Again, I know I've been saying this for a couple of weeks, but hopefully by the end of end of this week or end of this, you know, end of the next two weeks, um, we'll be going live and it won't be perfect, but it'll be up. Um, and then uh, we'll take it from there. So um, again, Alan, thank you so much uh, for coming on. Eric. Yeah. Nice job. Jason has been very, very quiet tonight. Um, he's been, sure he's been in the background producing, man. <laughs> I'm doing what I do scenes. best, hiding. Yeah? Not yeah, like I'm here. I just, uh, I for some reason, you guys aren't hearing me. So uh, I am here, and uh, thank you. All right. All right. So, guys, have a good night. And remember, next week, and remember from now on, keep imaging, keep educating, keep having fun, and we'll see you next week on Astro World TV. Thanks for watching.